Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming along to this uh, uh, postgraduate taster day. Um, so what, um, what I and my colleagues are going to do today is um, give you a little bit of, of a snapshot, a bit of a, a bit of a taste of the kind of research that um, we do uh, in linguistics and, and in translation here at SIAS. Um, and my, my colleagues are going to uh, tell you about a, a very exciting uh, research project that um, many of us are involved with. And before that, um, first I and then Gloria are going to give you uh, just a few very quick details about uh, how you can be a part of uh, our research culture here in linguistics uh, and translation. So let me share my screen. And that is what I want to share. Has that worked or have I shared the wrong thing? <laughs> Let me try again. Let me try again. Uh, this is what we want. That looks better. Okay. Yes, so. perfect. So yes, uh, I, I, like I said, my name is, is Chris Lucas and I'm one of the conveners of our uh, linguistics programs here at SIAS. Um, and uh, what research do we in the Department uh, of Linguistics do uh, here at SIAS? Well, a very broad range of research. And uh, these, what I've listed here are, are some of the areas of linguistics that different members of staff are, are involved with. And I've kind of ordered them for you there from uh, most theoretical and, 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 and least applied with semantics and syntax at the top, all the way down to um, uh, the, the most applied subjects where uh, we're really interested in uh, the intersection between uh, the study of language and society. Um, and in, in, we're all in the department involved with doing research in uh, one or more of, of these areas. I personally uh, am most interested in the stuff, uh, the, the bottom half of the top half. So historical linguistics and language contact, that sort of thing. So I, I'm, I'm kind of someone who's, who's in the middle. And what you're going to be hearing about from my colleagues today is, is this exciting project, which is right down at the most applied end. So um, what can you do if you want to, if you like what you hear today and, and you want a, a piece of the action? Well, you can do uh, an MA in linguistics and you've got two major options. You can either do um, a one-year full-time MA in just linguistics or you can do uh, the same degree uh, combined with intensive study of a language. And that is then two years full time. And both of those you can also do part time over a longer period. Um, and with the MA in linguistics, uh, you have an optional pathway in language documentation and description. And you can see full details of um, what those two the structures of those two degrees on, on our web pages. Um, now, if you are interested in combining the study of linguistics with uh, the study of a language, these are the languages that uh, we currently offer for combination with linguistics. So Arabic, Japanese, Korean, Persian, Southeast Asian languages, currently you could do either Indonesian or Vietnamese, Swahili and Turkish. And here is um, a list of the modules we currently offer. So as you see, there's uh, uh, quite a few more theoretical modules and even more, uh, more uh, applied modules. And the theoretical modules cover... Oh, thank you, Nana. You, you could, I left out Hindi. That was very bad for me. So you can also do Hindi. Um, Yep, so the theoretical modules cover all of the most um, 
uh, all of the major areas of structural linguistics, the study of sound, the study of meaning, the study of how words are built, the study of how words combine, um, plus historical linguistics and looking at uh, a global view of the world's languages, that's linguistic typology. And then on the applied side, we have methods, modules, modules about documenting languages, modules about so sociolinguistics, supporting languages, planning languages, and some translation modules are also open to students uh, doing MA linguistics rather than MA translation, because obviously there's, there's a lot of crossover there. And finally, of course, everyone does uh, a dissertation in linguistics, which you submit about um, 11 months after you start your module, if you, your, your, your program, if you, do, if you do it full time in one year. Um, so that was my uh, lightning fast introduction. Like I said, I'm Chris Lucas, that's my email address. I convene with um, uh, my two colleagues, Julia and Jan. Please do write to us with any questions you might have. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And um, that is everything I wanted to say. So I will hand over now to Gloria. Thanks. I, yeah, I meant to unmute myself, but press the wrong button. Anyway, right. So um, I'm taking a slightly different approach. Uh, just by introducing um, the structure uh, of the program and um, how it is designed considering the changing role of translators in the um, 21st century. And by the way, my name is Gloria Lee. I am the co-convener of the MA translator, uh, translation program with uh, Nana. So, uh, if you have uh, visited our web page, you will notice that uh, our program aims to enhance our students' um, methodological practical skills in translation, uh, preparing for the uh, professional market. Uh, and we also provide our students an um, intellectual perspective on the discipline of translation studies, just in case they want to pursue a research degree. Um, but what actually makes a good translator uh, in the 21st century. So uh, will translation students only fit for translating text or they can um, engage with other uh, exciting jobs uh, that require cross-cultural uh, cross communication skills? Um, yeah. So um, traditionally people think that you know, any bilinguals can be a translator or interpreter. Uh, but without cultural knowledge, you cannot really produce a meaningful message that people will listen. And sometimes it's simply because that they, they're not aware that you're actually speaking to them. So translator needs to be sensitive to cultural differences to make their um, communication effective and, and efficient. Um, this is especially the case in the uh, digital age when technology is developed to facilitate machine translation or uh, computer aided translation. Um, some, I got students asking me, you know, whether uh, human translators will be replaced one day by computers, you know. Uh, well, it's true that translators these days, they, they need to acquire a certain degree of IT literacy, um, especially software tools that help manage terminology and compile translation memories, which we have uh, courses on that, um, modules on that. But I think what is more important is to identify the part of communication that cannot be replaced by machine, because after all, we're interacting with human beings. Um, so that's why it's also important to understand other channels that generate meaning apart from the verbal uh, languages. So um, we're talking about the multimodal dimensions. So in courses, uh, in modules like uh, subtitling that we aim to explore um, other 
channels that generate meaning apart from the verbal languages, such as uh, visual images, uh, acoustic components like music and sound. Um, please visit our webpage and you'll find details of all these modules addressing uh, very important aspects of translations in its broadest sense. Uh, just like uh, Chris just said, our students also need to uh, work on a dissertation to apply such knowledge in practice. Um, they can choose to work on a translation project if they are interested in specific types of translation, um, like a literary translation, if you want to translate a play, if you want to translate short stories, novels, um, and it can also be a um, audiovisual text. So you can subtitle a um, video clip or a film um, or even websites, you know. Um, another option would be a research-based project focusing on a selected topic. But in both cases, students are required to reflect on the translation practice and um, think about how decisions are being made in different uh, cross-cultural uh, communicative situations. So uh, now you will understand why our graduates can find jobs in areas other than translation agencies and uh, language services, um, language service providers. Uh, by the time they complete the program, they would have attained um, interlingual and intercultural communication skills. And they would also be able to articulate such practice to people around them, um, helping to create a translation space, which uh, in the word of Michael Cronin, a translation scholar that facilitates dialogue across difference. So that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, please visit our website at um, MA Translation and also the Center for Translation Studies. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, by email. Thank you very much. Um, is it my turn? Oh, very good. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we had we have this complicated schedule which we arranged ahead, and now I can't remember it. But um, let me just see whether I can get my slides up. I think I can. Very good. Yes. So, um, in, against the background of the of the of the program outlines, but we wanted to do now and use the rest of the time to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing. And Chris already hinted at that. Um, this is, I'm going to introduce a, a project and then um, both Yen and Nana will talk about specific outcomes of that and, and, and results from it. Um, but it's a project which we are keen on because it's a, it's a collaborative one, which brings lots of us in, in the School of Languages and Cultures and Linguistics together, actually across SOAS together. Um, and it sits, it sits in the applied element, and that's what we're talking about. But just looking at Chris's introduction, actually, there's a lot of really interesting stuff also on the more formal stuff. So because it generates texts in these different languages, and you can see already here the languages we cover. I have a little slide about that just now. Um, and we haven't really even touched these texts. There's so much, so much potential and possibility. You know, I, I work on African language. Sorry, my name is Lutz Martin. I'm part of the department. So I work on African languages. And um, we have we have uh, uh, Somali text, we have Swahili text recordings, which would really lend themselves to more formal analysis as well, because you know they're, they're often there's multilingualism, there's language mixing, links to the language context, so lots of potential. But that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about culture translation and interpreting of COVID-19 risks among London's ethnic ethnic communities, um, and the, the the project overseen and organized and orchestrated by Nana, who's going to talk a bit later. And then you can see there's a bunch of us who are involved in the in the project as well. And it is funded by 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 the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so by by government funding. Um, I'm trying to now go to my next slide, and I do that now. Um, this is a bit of COVID-19 context, and you can see. I won't go into detail. This is um, mainly UK. It's partly England England focused. But we've been through two years, really, of COVID-19, starting from March 2020 with the first lockdown. And then <clears throat> if things go as, as envisioned, um, we will go, end COVID restrictions on the, on the 1st of April coming. And in between, there was lots of activities, including lockdowns and coming out of lockdowns. Um, but it, it was really, it was, it, it was, it, it was you know, a very, very severe um, health crisis, uh, which took lots of casualties. So this is um, a, a graphic summary of the of COVID-19 in the UK context. 
Uh, this is the number of infections. You can see that it spikes then January 21 um, and then goes up again in January 2022. That's when Omicron hits. Um, so the infection rates are really, really high. So COVID is, I mean, they, they've gone down since, but it's still with us. And it is something which is important to conceptualize, to think about, to talk about both in the UK context and in the global context, which is, you know, for us in, in, in many ways, it's a source perspective to look a bit more widely. Um, this is, this is a, a better graphics, if you like. This is the um, a graphic representation of the deaths uh, resulting from COVID-19, and that has gone down quite a bit. So even though the infection rate has spiked, the the um, the death rates and the severity of the of the of the pandemic that has gone down. But even then, of course, there is still quite. You can see it goes still goes up at the beginning of of this year. So this is roughly where we are in the UK. This is an international snapshot. That's from the World Health Organization. Just shows the infection rate, and as you know. They, they, are, they are really severe. This is a world global crisis with global effects um, on, on human well-being, on human health and on human lives. Um, and this is it, it, it's by country. So you can see the UK is there in fifth position, I think. But that's, of course, it doesn't take into account the size of the population. But this is really just to show that it's, that it's global and the effects are, are strong. Um, the other thing people have noticed, going back to the UK context, is that um, that it looks like that um, members of minority ethnic communities are more affected by COVID-19 than others. So the chart here is, um, we have reproduced here, this is the, the um, death rate of different ethnic communities in, the, in England, so not in England, um, compared to the white group. And you can see that you know, the more green you have, the more, the more the effects are. So it's either double the rate or three times the rate. Um, and then the different shades of green are adjusting for things like geography where people live to socioeconomic status and health status. But even if you do this adjusting, you still find that the effects are disproportionately higher um, on ethnic community um, communities. Um, and then people have asked him what, what could be the reason for that? And that it may to do with occupation and jobs with higher COVID-19 risk or customer facing jobs. It might be the financial impact of the pandemic the living in more urban or maybe deprived areas, living in multi-generational households, so less space for isolation, less likely maybe to have access to a private garden. And the effects of the pandemic on mental health, that's, that's a really important issue. But what we are focusing on is also questions of language and communication. So this is where our project then comes in. Um, and we're focusing on London. And in London, it's particularly important because London's, London's ethnic complexity is higher maybe than the rest of the UK. As you can see, this is uh, 2011 census data, and we don't have the new one yet, uh, but you can see that uh, about 60% of London population in 2011 uh, were, were white, whereas that means 40% are non-white, and that's a much higher proportion than the rest of the country, uh, of the UK, where, which sits at, at 13%. So it makes sense to look in London. Um, so London Community Languages and COVID-19, our project is UKRI funded, government funded, it's a source-based project, where we look at London's more than 300 languages, focused on 17 SOAS languages because, because speakers of community languages are disproportionately affected. And one reason might be to do with information. Um, and that is because London's multilingual communities translate and interpret COVID-19 information from different sources to inform the understanding of the pandemic. Um, so I won't go that in, in too much detail, but the project investigates information about COVID-19 in London's community languages. We look at information flow government information, informal information, both from the UK and from other places people have links to. We have both quantitative and qualitative research methods. So we did online surveys, but also lots of ethnographic and textual research, interviews and focus group. And we have, as we say, as I said, 17 languages. There's the list of languages, including Arabic, Bengali, and Hindi, as Nana mentioned earlier, but also Korean, Swahili, Sileti, and Yoruba. So these are, these are, these are all prominent, if you like, source languages. Um, uh, briefly on the results, we have quantitative results, about 700 respondents um, have, have uh, answered our questionnaire. And two, two answers I have here which are interesting is one is about three quarters of our respondents says um, they get information from COVID-19 from outside the UK, from other countries or communities outside the UK. So this is a really high proportion. Um, of, of our constituency, that is people draw on both UK information and information in other language from other parts of the world. Um, and then the other question was, do you think you have, you have sufficient information about COVID-19 
and the, you know, fairly solid 8% said straightforwardly no, and a quarter of respondents said we, they are not sure, but we have information. 67% said yes, yes, we have. So information really plays a role here. And I briefly, before I, I hand over or get kicked out, um, uh oh, um, I give you a snap, snapshot of the quality of the qualitative results. Sorry, that should be qualitative. So this is from our focus groups. Um, so key issues and discourses about COVID-19 in London's diverse language community include questions of trust. That was really a very strong signature message we got. You know, who, who do you trust? Which person? Which body? Which information? Which language? There's a difference between official and informal discourses. That's quite important. Government information, NHS information versus social media. You know, you have WhatsApp groups, chat groups. You have you know, TikTok, Instagram, information spreading through there. Social media, I, I said it just now, is really important, uh, but also actually word to mouth and, and just your own personal private networks, even just, just like face to face communication. Um, differences in government policies, that's quite remarkable. The, you know, UK policy as well was very different from Japanese policy, was very different from Tanzanian policy, and that had an effect. Um, written words is spoken language, and we haven't looked at signed language, but that would come into that as well. So that, that makes, makes, makes a difference. Um, then the question of authority, who has authority in the specific communities, is it your local GP, is it community leaders, is it religious leaders, is it elected leaders, or is it, is it you know, councils and, and, and governments even. Um, so there we got different responses, but everybody, all our responses sort of touched on that. And then of course the question English versus non-English sources, that's in some sense at the heart of our project, and, and we picked that up quite, quite strongly as well in the, in the qualitative research we did. Um, with that, I think I'm done and I can um, stop sharing my screen. Um, and then we can move on to first to Yen, I think, and then to Nana to hone and a little bit more on the results we, we have um, discovered. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Lutz. Let me start by sharing my screen. My name is um, Yen Cheung, and I work at Department of Linguistics. I want to talk about a more specific topic, that is, what can we linguists do in um, COVID-19 era, and to what extent what we have learned can help us achieve a better understanding of the pandemic. So here I have um, listed quite some books that have been accumulating um, in the sense that they all contribute to our understanding of COVID-19, and some of them are specifically related to the analysis of um, language um, because our perception of COVID comes from many types of discourse around us and in many languages. I happen to belong to a sub-project related to this um, mega project that Lutz has just um, introduced um, because I work on one strand that is on Chinese discourse and the Chinese community in London. We, as we perceived a time difference between um, the time when COVID broke out in mainland China and also in East Asian countries and the time when COVID finally reached London. So we thought it was interesting and necessary for us to, start the, to study the narratives in Chinese uh, back in the home country. And we found it useful because um, I'm of the finding that um, people here in London, um, the Chinese people are more or less related to each other in a virtual community, um, which is backed up by the influence of Chinese language and discourse. So um, I worked on Chinese language and I collected data in trying to answer these um, sets of questions. For example, how has the pandemic discourse being phrased and propagated in different places and languages. So in my case, obviously I'm interested in study of Chinese and also to what extent um, the discourse related to COVID-19 frame unconsciously the community ideology and provides the thesis or antithesis for decisions and measures in the pandemic era. And um, what can we do, especially as linguists? Um, Chris has given us many branches of linguistics that we work on and teach 
um, at SOAS. But then this is a new kind of topic um, because it relates to many aspects of language that cannot be easily summarized in terms of one branch of linguistics. But um, as Chris said, that this belongs to a very applied aspect. Um, so I have been trying to see to what extent we can handle this kind of data from a quantitative point of view. Um, that is, suppose that um, we want to understand the discourse in China over there, and um, there are conspicuous and also hidden aspects related to the discourse. We could have collected 30 articles uh, belonging to different times and study their distribution, the content and, and characteristics. But this is the older kind of study, um, as I believe. Suppose now that we have all the data in hand and we have very powerful software to deal with all the data, what should we do? And this is something that um, we've been doing. Yep. We want to collect data uh, and study COVID-19 discourse in Chinese from a longitudinal point of view. Yep. We aim at exhaustiveness. So um, I um, have been uh, devoting myself to the collection of all the COVID related articles um, that have been um, published in one certain newspaper in China. Um, so that, that is quite a lot um, because up to now I've got about uh, more than 10,000 pages of data. Yeah. And uh, that starts from the very beginning of COVID-19, that is the January of 2020. And, and now I, I've been made busy again because COVID has again hit China in a mess, on a massive scale. Um, so what can we do about it? Suppose we have all the data and I have um, acquired a very powerful and almost free software that's called um, Mini Word Cloud um, that is specially dedicated to the processing of Chinese data, but can also be used to analyze data in English. So what we usually do when dealing with, uh, for example, electronic text analysis, you know, we need to do word segmentation. And this, this is important for Chinese because the words are not automatically segmented. All you see are characters. And then we need to do parts of speech tagging and we need to add in some special COVID related glossary. Uh, that is probably not in the original dictionary of the software. Then we'll be able to measure word frequency. Um, we'll be able to identify keywords um, because um, some of the words are common, but we don't really treat them as keywords for our purpose, which is uh, COVID-19 discourse. Then we can study concordance. That is how words uh, relate to others in the text collocation and how words will uh, match, find their companies in other grammatical, in grammatical environments right? and how words prefer uh, to relate to some other words in meaning, which is what we call um, semantic preference. And then in a more imperceptible way, um, to what extent um, the paragraph conveys some special senses that are probably not obviously denoted by the words contained in there. Uh, that is what we call semantic prosody analysis. But finally, um, one interesting aim of our study is to try to extract metadata from the discourse. Um, to what extent all this discourse uh, tells us about the ideology um, of the language users of a particular language and how we review that um, because we can study all these, uh, the previous aspects in able to establish a set of propositions about the discourse and to what extent they change over time um, as COVID-19 uh, proceeds in that community. 
So I'll, I'll briefly give you some findings. Um, I skip over some um, pages, but uh, let me give you some um, um, visualized findings. Um, so for example, we look at one month data. Right? We can work out here in colored graphs, um, the number of verbs, nouns, um, uh, and other, words with dual nature, that is both verb and noun, and adjectives and others. And what are some keywords related to this distribution? And this gives us, uh, for example, um, the, the, this picture relates to August um, last year, then the keyword is no longer um, COVID-19, uh, the most conspicuous keyword, uh, it becomes um, something like injection um, in Chinese. And that is related to a word called vaccination. And uh, if we want to study further, then we can study the link among these words, right? Ways you, we can uh, pr produce several different kinds of models to review the link. And the number of words are given in another way here. But if we really want to study the distribution in each sentence, in each segment of discourse, we can do it right here. I give you an example of um, injection, the word injection here. Yep. And uh, uh, to the right-hand side, we have um, the other clustered words that are related to this verb. So I can pick up another word from the right hand side and throw it in. And what we can get is, um, well, th this is a, an example where injection is related to vaccination and it's related to another word called virus. And to what extent these three words appear together in sentences that we can identify in all this range of discourse. Um, that can reveal quite a lot about how discourse has been phrased in this language. So um, very quickly, um, I want to say that this provides a model of discourse uh, that makes it possible for us to carry on longitudinal research over discourse in Chinese. Um, we can get to know many interesting aspects of COVID related discourse in Chinese as I've listed on the right hand side. But this is only one part of the project because we can then move on to study other kinds of discourse like um, uh, more private discourse in social media yeah, and we can make comparisons. So um, very quickly, um, I have um, given a summary of uh, one of the streams in this project that I've been carrying, but uh, my colleagues are also doing very interesting topic studies in other languages. Um, so in fact, there is not just one approach in linguistics or in humanities that can help us um, um, get a better understanding of the discourse. Um, there are many different approaches and many of them have been carried out at our department and at our School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. I think it's my turn. I try to share my slides. Can you see it? Can you see my slide? Great. Thank you. So. Okay. There you go. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our open day today. Um, my name is Nana Sato Rosberg. I happen to be the head of languages, cultures, and linguistics, or sorry, department of, <laughs> no, school of languages, cultures, and linguistics. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous today. Um, and I would like to thank Chris, Lutz, Gloria, and Yang for um, great presentations. 
and um, I'm teaching transition studies here at SOAS together with Gloria. Um, so I would like to talk a bit about uh, how our COVID-19 projects um, relate to transition studies. For example, as Ruth already um, informed you, about 300 languages are spoken in London. And um, if you look at a governmental health information website, for example, this kind of page, you will find about 10, 11 translations in other languages. But considering that 300 languages are spoken, 10, 11 languages are not enough. And many people have trouble getting um, enough information around COVID-19. So as Ruth already presented, we conducted online survey. And um, our results show like this. So many people think that there is a language barrier. Well, cultural upbringing reflects the application and adherence to procedures and then the operational measures. And some many people feel that um, it's not only about language, but there is a cultural barrier. So, for example, if I explain um, about uh, COVID-19 and my cultural background is East Asia, probably if I explain this to Lutz, Lutz will interpret, understand differently because Lutz and I don't share those cultural background 100% and um, Lutz will translate that information differently. So even though I saw that I uh, explained the correct information to Lutz, because of the cultural background we share, and then um, the first language we speak is different. Actually, the information I provided to Lutz will be translated differently. And then maybe he will not behave as much as I expected him to behave away. For example, maybe he will not wear a mask, but I will wear a mask. For example, it's just example. Lutz wears a mask, please don't misunderstand. And um, many of people uh, answered our questionnaire saying that I don't think people are understanding the information. This is exactly um, coming from what I explained now. There is a, a confusion of information, let's put it this way, because actually it is English information provided by the government. Uh, not all English speakers understood well enough. And if those information were translated into other languages and that do not share culture much, um, it doesn't work so well. And there is a problem here on how to translate. And the final one, also we've had a lot of uh, opinion like this. I think educating community leaders could help in this regard. So as Ruth already pointed out, a community leader could be GP or religious leader or so on. But the most important point here is that these community leader probably can provide those information in the right manner so that community members can understand those COVID-19 information correctly. This is the point which is implied this answer. So next slide, go. So to become a translator, that means that you translate from some texts written in, for example, English into, let's say, Chinese or Arabic or Japanese. It's not good, good enough, as Gloria already pointed out, right? Means you will be a specialist of cultural communication. Because if you don't understand those uh, cultural difference, actually, even if you know those two languages, you actually cannot translate or mediate those two cultures. Uh, well, so that means that if you are becoming a real translator, that means that you will be a specialist of cultural communication or you become a cultural mediator. Um, so without understanding culture, it is not possible to master language and you cannot be quality, um, you cannot do quality translation. I'm going to come back to this point later, okay? For example, the narrative of why you have to wear a mask is different in, for example, East Asia. 
and then um, in, in the US, for example. And that is a kind of interesting <laughs> kind of uh, saying about masks. So to protect yourself from COVID-19, you're wearing mask, or to protect others, you're wearing a mask. Why is it both? Think about it. Think about it. It's very important for you to think about it because master program is for you to think about it and to find the answer. We teachers cannot give you answer. Right. How do you translate it? Wearing masks. Why do you have to wear a mask? Or maybe you don't have to wear a mask. But why do you think that way? Uh, I have to move this. Okay. So why wearing a mask? I think um, during COVID-19 pandemic, many countries uh, uh, created the regulation that you have to wear a mask. But I think, especially early time of COVID-19, many countries or people who live in many countries, except for East Asia, they felt, why should I wear a mask? What's the point of wearing a mask, right? And I found a very interesting article from, from uh, the BBC. This was published like a, a day, two days ago. I don't remember, but anyway, recently. And there is an article which was written by a Singaporean. And then he precisely stated this. Step outside your door without a face mask in Hong Kong, Seoul, or Tokyo, and you may well get the disapproving look. I can show you how people <laughs> will look at you if you don't have a mask, even now in Tokyo. Something like this, okay? You will be treated, treated as if you are criminal. It's unfortunately the truth. Am I right, Yam and Gloria? I'm not exaggerating, exactly. Yes. 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 <laughs> Social pressure. <laughs> <laughs> is really, really, really high there. So um, if you don't have a mask, you'll be treated as like a criminal. So you will wear a mask. And actually, I think this, this kind of understanding is shared by uh, uh, Hong Kongese and then Korean as well. So actually making trouble to others is considered as bad habit. So think about other people rather than yourself. So. I have been educated by my parents, school teachers, everybody, that if you have a mask, if you wear a mask, you can protect other people to be infected by you. So I shouldn't spread those virus to other people. To protect other people, have a mask. Right, this comes first. So always perspective is not myself, but how I have to see the world is, I have to see from others' perspectives, okay? This is how kind of a Japanese language is considered and structured. And I, I, I don't speak Chinese, so I cannot speak for Chinese, but as a culture, this is shared. And as a language actually structured in, in Japanese language, so we often omit subject or second persona so that the subject like I is not so important in, in a Japanese language and Japanese culture. So if you don't wear a mask in Japan or, or Hong Kong or so, um, people interpret or translate it is a meaning that you are not a considerable person. So there is a discontext. And uh, imagine if you have to translate some text which refers to mask written in Japanese or Chinese, and you have to translate it into uh, English. But actually, philosophy behind or culture behind is very different, I believe. And how would you translate? this context or philosophy behind. Because if you translate uh, just word or sentence, actually your audience will not get what you really want to write or what you really want to translate. Ha, ah, actually to translate something is a very, very tough, difficult thing to do. That's why you need to study at the master level, especially 
place like a source because it's very multilingual and a multicultural. So perception. Depending on what kind of culture habit you are used to, this might lead you to behave in a different way. That's why we are researching on uh, 17 language communities in London. Because as I already explained, even if Lutz and I get the same information, actually how we understand that information is very different. So as a result, how we behave based on those information will be different, right? When you translate, for example, English COVID rules into another language, you need to understand this. Otherwise, your translation will not work for your reader, target audience. That's how translation studies people call because it's not about really word or language, it's about culture and the philosophy behind. So as a translator, you have to well understand at least two languages and then two cultures and philosophies very well, okay? And by learning translation theories, I think already Gloria pointed out, translation theories, cultural translation and a practical translation, you will learn all these crucial elements at source because we offer not only languages, but linguistics, a translation studies modules, and also philosophy and history and so on. So hopefully you can master not only languages, but also cultural and the philosophical aspect. So the, these are the people who presented today. And you, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Right, Imogen, could I ask you to facilitate um, Q&A, please? Hi, yes, sure. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. No questions so far. Any questions are welcome. Someone's just saying a big thank you for your hard work. Um, but I just wondered whether you had any tips for anybody applying to the department. Could you please repeat the question? I'm sorry. Sure. So there's no questions at the moment, but I just wondered if you had any kind of um, tips for applying. Oh, tips for applying for our programs. Great. Yeah. Maybe Chris, Jan, Gloria. Is it for linguistics or translation? Anyway, maybe Chris? I mean, uh, frankly, the number one tip is um, work as hard as you can in your VA and get a good result. And then we will welcome you with open arms. Uh, of course, in addition to that is, um, you know, uh, in your application materials, show, sh show us, give us evidence for your interest in linguistics or translation? What, what, what questions have you been considering? Um, what linguistic or translation related questions have you been considering? What have you read? What, what interested you most about what you've read? These kinds of things show us that you, you have, you have a, a serious and genuine interest in, in the subject you're applying for. Gloria, do you want to add? Or? Uh, I think we have a question asking uh, whether they can do an MA in translation as a part-time student. Yes, you can. Uh, for a part-time student, I think uh, you need to spend two years uh, working. Yeah, or, or three years. Oh yeah, all three years, yeah. Uh, they, they're asking whether the classes that they must attend in person uh, so this particular year is, uh, is yeah, that uh, this year is still online, but um, we next year will probably be uh, in-person uh, classes, right? 
Okay, that's okay. Image, imaging will facilitate the questions. So sorry, can I can I just briefly yes. on, the, on the on the full time? I think it's an interesting discussion. It might be useful to take it actually outside of here because it partly depends on the flexibility of your employer, I think, because whether it's in person meetings or online meetings, the schedule might be the same. So at the moment, we have lots of pre recorded lectures, which you can watch whenever. So that's perfectly compatible with holding a full time job. But there are also seminars, which are, you know, mine are Tuesday at 11 and Tuesday at 1. And if you have a full time job, that's hard. And you can't, you know, you have to come to these, these seminars. So I think it depends how much leeway your employer has. And then, you know, which part time is it two years or three years? But it will involve, I think, at least one day where you would have to be able not to work or at least work around the, the schedule. Um, but it, you know, I'm, I'm happy, or any of us are happy to discuss your particular case in, in more detail. I have one more. Um, so for linguistics and intensive language, can we apply if we don't have a basis in that language? Yes, the answer is yes, you can, you can be a beginner. And, uh, but also you can be more advanced. Uh, we, we, we cater to most levels for most of the languages. And can they go on summer abroad or? Yes, I mean, for every language, I don't know, but for, for most, for most certainly, yeah, yeah. I, I know best about Arabic and, and there we, we have a summer abroad in Jordan, so yeah. Level of language are we expected to have for an M MA translation? In my case, it's Japanese. Sorry, could you repeat the first part? I couldn't sure, hear so, uh, What level of language are we expected to have for an MA translation? In my case, it's Japanese. Japanese, thank you very much for your question. So if you plan to translate from English into Japanese, you need to have um, JLPT2. And if it's opposite from Japanese into English and then JLPT3. But if you have any further questions, please just, just email me. Thank you. Great. And then we have another question. Do you cover translation techniques like bilateral interpreting and Chukata? I'm not quite sure about the pronunciation of that. <laughs> I'm not a linguist, sorry. <laughs> I think uh, uh, the uh, audience is asking about interpreting, uh, different forms of interpreting. I think we only have one course on um, interpreting that is between Chinese and English. Yes. So yeah, it's, it's not really facilitated you know, for other um, language care. Great. And then another one. Um, so I'm very interested in the pathway language documentation and description. I would like to know if field work is severely affected because of COVID. Um, I, you know, I, I can speak to that. And the answer is yes. Uh, very, very sad. We, from March 2020 for a year, two years, it was really difficult. So we have lots of, like we have you know, researchers like postdocs who really are struggling. Our PhD students, we all, all ask them now to have a plan B, to think, you know, what happens if I can't travel? What can I do? But now it's better. So I, I you know, I have a small document, not, you know, a, a description project, if you like, um, in southern Kenya. And we went out with the team in February, and that was fine. And we are going again out in April. And we, I was supposed to go in the summer of 2020. So it was really you know, hit badly. So we are now replanning and reconstituting, putting the project back together to, to make sure that it happens. So I think you know, at, at the moment, it looks much better than a year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but also for the masters, of course, you don't have to do field work. So the master's students are slightly sheltered from that because I mean, you, you can, but it's, if it's a full-time program, it's very intensive and there's no expectation that you have original data. So, so it's, it's, you know, in that sense, you're, you're fine. But I, if things go, they continue the way they are going now, I think it will be less of a problem going forward. Thank you. Um, Alexandra has a question. So I've accepted my offer to study MA Linguistics. Um, I have a BA in Arabic and Persian. Do you have staff specialized in Arabic dialects, more precisely North African, that could guide with my dissertation? Yeah, I've got good news for you, Alexandra. The, I, Arabic, the linguistics of Arabic dialects is, this, is exactly what I specialize in. Um, I, I do a lot of work on Maltese, which uh, from a, linguistic point of view is is North African Arabic so 
yeah, sounds great. I would love to love to work with you on that. I saw you had another question. No, it wasn't you. It was someone else. So I'll let I'll let Imogen. Yeah, Chris, I just sorry to disturb you. Yeah, Aisha is working also in North Africa and Arabic as well, right? So yeah, I mean Aisha. I don't want to speak for Aisha, but, uh, yeah, but she, 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 mainly she works on Berber, which is mm. a different North African language. Yeah. Not sure she actually speaks Arabic, um, but I, I don't, I, I her, definitely, her, she mainly works on Berber. Um, yeah. But yeah, obviously, she has a lot yes. of expertise in that area as well. So you and Aisha. Yeah. Yes. Great. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no problem. Um, so we've got one uh, second to last question from Rainey. Is it possible if I apply for MA translation, but both English and other languages are not my first language? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, that was easy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> one last question from Phyllis. Uh, can I transfer from MA linguistics to to MA linguistics and intensive languages if I already received an offer of MA linguistics? Yes, that's no problem at all. I mean, it's it's no bad thing if you do it uh, before you come, but even if you wanted to do it in the first week you were, you were here, that would also be possible, but it's probably better to do it. Mm -hmm. Get in touch with admissions beforehand and get it all sorted before you come here. Great. Um, just one last question that's come in. Um, I was also wondering for students uh, to choose the pathway LDD, are their dissertations should be closely related to LDD, even if they do not have original data? Um, yes, yes, I think so. And LDD, it's it's quite broad. So it goes back to what Chris says earlier. There's there's a field work, a description, structural element, but there's also a strong applied social linguistic component. So in, in LDD, people can also work on language virtualization, language policy frameworks, or indeed if you're on the structural side, it might be it might be secondary data from the literature. There's lots of archives, endangered language archives now, which are essentially are data depositories. So you can work with those data. Or maybe have a small empirical project in London. We've seen London's linguistic complexity, um, so that that might be possible. Or indeed a small fieldwork project, but it would be small just because at least the full-time version of the program is very very tight. But uh, but the dissertation should should link to LDD in 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 different ways. But it doesn't have to include original data. I think that's about the right position. Right, thanks so much. I think that's all the questions. Thanks so much to everyone who attended and all our panelists today. Um, and I'll just stop the recording. And yeah, um, thanks so much for coming and have a good day. Thank, thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank, thank you. you. Hope to Bye. see you in September. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.